Good morning, Secretary General of the OAS, Jose Miguel Insulza, Dr. Abraham Lowenthal, Professor Emeritus of International Relations at the University of Southern California, Dr. Mariano Bertucci, Postdoctoral Fellow at the Center for Inter-American Policy and Research at Tulane University, Ambassador Thomas Shannon, Counselor at the U.S. Department of State, Dr. Cynthia Arnson, Director Latin American Program at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars, Dr. Fred Bernstein, Senior Fellow and Director Emeritus of the Peterson Institute for International Economics, permanent representatives and alternates of the member states of the OAS, permanent observers, special guests, and members of the audience. Thank you all for joining us here today in this 60th second OAS policy roundtable entitled Scholars, Policymakers, and International Affairs, Finding a Common Cause. This event has been co-organized by the Wilson Center for Scholars and the Organization of American States. We also welcome all of those who are watching us uh, live via webcast. The objective of this roundtable is to explore the main arguments put forth in the book co-edited by Dr. Lowenthal and Dr. Bertucci with regards to the interaction, or lack thereof, between the worlds of academia and policymaking in the field of international affairs. We seek to discuss why it is relevant to narrow the gap between scholars and decision makers in foreign policy and some of the ways in which we can bridge the existing disconnect. The great British economist John Minor Keynes once said that, quote, madmen in authority who hear voices in the air are distilling their frenzy from some academic scribbler of a few years back, end of quote. This may or may not be true, but I would very much prefer to entrust the practical influence of scholars and scientists to something more reliable than the policymakers' neurotic impulses. Instead, we ought to build institutions, incentives, and practices that could make the relationship between the madmen in power and the scribblers a more productive one than the one we see today. For the truth is that even in a town like Washington, D.C., where we have thousands of decision makers and scholars coexisting in a small ecosystem, such links are far from natural. It is, in fact, a relationship often fraught with mistrust. Academics usually decry the loss of rigor that almost always comes with the political usage of scientific findings and fear the prospect of their conclusions being hijacked for political purposes that they may not share. Policymakers, in turn, have little patience for the nuances and refinements that characterize much academic production, whose conclusions are often oblivious to the brutal constraints, material, political, and most of all, of time, that are par for course in the political world. The result of this disconnect is a net loss for both sides. Policy outcomes suffer as a result of their weak scientific grounding, and academic endeavors lose their ability to achieve the standard that the great Karl Marx once set for philosophers, one that is equally applicable to scientists, the goal of not merely to understand the world, but to change it. Our free societies are heirs to the Enlightenment, to the notion that scientific discovery, underpinned by free inquiry, leads to human advancement. When the links between science and collective decisions are severed, the promise of the Enlightenment is compromised. That's why probing the links between academics and policymakers is no trivial matter. This discussion raises important questions about the social value of academic freedom and about the ability of democratic societies to deploy rational arguments to resolve collective problems. To discuss this issue, we have put together a first-class panel with expert scholars and practitioners in the field. Firstly, 
The Secretary General of the OAS, His Excellency Jose Miguel Insulza, will deliver the introductory remarks. Subsequently, Dr. Lowenthal will present his recently published book, which is the focus of our discussion today. We will then proceed to a panel discussion moderated by Dr. Cynthia Arnson, Director of the Latin American Program at the Wilson uh, International Center for Scholars. And we are honored to be joined in this panel by Ambassador Tom Shannon and by Dr. Fred Bernstein. We'll later have the opportunity to discuss with our distinguished panelists in our Q&A session towards the end of the event. Without further ado, Secretary General Insulza, the floor is yours. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Thank you all for being here. And uh, I will not certainly say again who are the members of the panel. They are well known and they are really honored us with their presence. And we are very grateful that you accepted this invitation to participate in the discussion. About the, what we call the links, the benefits that can be reached by a good understanding between scholars and uh, governments and practitioners, and of course the narrow, the gaps that we want to narrow as much as possible. The steps that can be adopted to achieve a better connection between the academia and the policy makers in the field. I just want to, accept, to, to recognize also the, president of, the presence of our ambassadors here. Thank you very much for being here. And of course, um, thank our friend Luigi Einaudi, former Secretary General of the OAS for when I arrived here, he was in that, in that post, and I always remember him with a very grateful, I'm very, always very grateful to him. Uh, I thank also Abe Lowenthal and Mariano Bertucci for being here first and also for inviting me to the discussion of the papers to this, of, for this book at Brown University some time ago. Well, I, 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 well Abe is going to present the details of the arguments and cases put forth in the book. I'll just say uh, a few words uh, uh, on why I consider this discussion relevant. In the foreign policy arena especially, as perhaps in, it's true also in other fields, relationship between academia and policy makers has been and should be a close and symbiotic one. Probably the many allusions to the gaps that have been made in this discussion have to do with the famous uh, articles or published by uh, uh, Stanley Hoffman in the Kissinger years, something, I remember the New York Review of Books, there was something called The Case of Dr. Kissinger, and another chapter in his book, in, 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 a, in a book of his called The Course of Dr. Kissinger, in which he tries to present precisely some of the issues we're going to be dealing with, only he does it in a, very, in a very critical way. One thing is what you teach in the universities, and another thing is what you what you find when you are going to govern. That's the whole idea. And uh, of course, uh, as I say, Hoffman has a very critical view of the gaps between the things. But I think that in general, we can say that uh, it is possible to narrow the gap. And that many cases are presented in which this, is, uh, this, is, this happens in reality. For example, in the, in the book, Nora Lustig re reminds us that the, the, conditional transfer, the conditional cash transfers in, Me in, in Mexico the Progresa and Oportunidades program was influenced by academic research. And part of its sustainability over time, despite, despite the changes in the, in, even in the party, in the presidency, are due to the fact that it's implement, the implementation and evaluation mechanisms were very sophisticated and have yielded indisputable success. In the same regard, I, should, I would mention just a personal experience when we are talking about, uh, about foreign policy. Uh, in the years, in the 90s, when I was working in Mexico, that's the when I first met Abe in those years, uh, together with several other Latin American scholars, we had a very active relation and interaction among us. And uh, under the leadership of Luciano Tomasini, uh, we created a group called Real, International Relations of Latin America. Jane Ferry, who is here, was also very important in that from the Ford Foundation. And the, the goal of that was academic. It was just to interact among us on the, on the foreign policy and of the governments in the region and uh, make some conclusions that would help us uh, uh, move on with our work. However, times changed very much in the Americas. And uh, 
In the decades that followed, seven members of Real have become foreign ministers of their countries. And very recently in Costa Rica, one member of was elected president of Costa Rica. He's, he's not our first foreign minister, he's our first president, Luis Guillermo Solís. And in many areas, the same things happen. And I believe that the relationship between academia and government in Latin America is frequent. And I want to believe, in many cases, it has a lot to do with the improvement of the quality of government we have seen in later years in Latin America, especially in the economic sector, not, sector, not only in the foreign policy sector. So uh, I, know I understand that this is easier said than done. And regardless of how overwhelmingly evident of the efficiency of a policy, may be uh, to tackle an international challenges, it will not translate into foreign policy automatically. The gaps between, uh, for example, between the acad academia and the, and the war on drugs are very evident, are very visible, and have been mentioned in Peter Andrea's chapter when he states uh, what he calls the dialogue of the deaf in matters of, of, of drug policy. He, for example, some very very well known, he reminds us that some very well known academics as, uh, as uh, Milton Friedman, who was certainly on the, I would say, on the very conservative side in matters of economics, was one of the, the main spears for legalization of drugs, just to show how different and how much uh, his economic ideas were very well, very well received, but his ideas on drugs were very, very, very unwelcome in the government and in Capitol Hill. So I think that the, the challenge is real. And I, even though we, scholars may value theory, uh, while policymakers value more pragmatic and more sensitive policy solutions, I think that we all agree that the stronger academia policymakers relationship is a beneficial one, and we should at least try to hold the, and to try and hold this debate and think how can we can bridge the ideas world with the real world, as the late Robert Pastor mentioned in, in, in this chapter in this book. I think that today we start building this bridge. I'm very happy to have you here. I know that all the audience is very eager to listen to you. So we are very, I just will uh, thank you for this opportunity for dialogue and for being at the Organization of American States. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Secretary General, for your remarks. Before we give the floor to Professor Lowenthal, I would like to read a brief excerpt from his extensive bio. Abraham F. Lowenthal is Professor Emeritus of International Relations at the University of Southern California in Los Angeles, President Emeritus of the Pacific Council of International Policy and adjunct professor at the Watson Institute and a non-resident senior fellow at the Brookings Institution. He was the founding director of both the Latin American program of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars and of the Inter-American Dialogue, and served as a Ford Foundation official in Latin America as director of studies at the Council on Foreign Relations and on numerous editorial and governance boards. His AB, MPA, and PhD are all from Harvard University. Abe is truly one of the pioneers in the academic field of U.S.-Latin America relations, among several other things, and a mentor to many of those who have tried to bridge the gap between the North and the South of the Americas, as well as the gap between the academic and the policymaking worlds. He has spent his professional life in many ways trying to straddle both worlds, and it has been a wonderfully productive career. You should know that the book that we are discussing here today has its origins in a conference held in Los Angeles in early 2011. I understood at the time that the conference was supposed to be a kind of swan song to bid Abe goodbye, some goodbye. All I see is that he's still going strong, writing, mentoring, sending emails at 11 p.m., things that reveal a phenomenal vitality and an unending intellectual curiosity. It is a privilege to have you here, Abe. We now give you the floor to present your book.
Thank you very much indeed, Kevin, for that warm and generous introduction. I wish my late mother uh, could uh, be here with us. She would have believed every word. Um, I'm indeed very pleased and honored to participate in launching this new book with the participation in the book of 13 other contributors from Latin America, Canada, the United States, and Europe, uh, uh, plus uh, Mariano Bertucci and myself. Th in addition to Mariano, whom I will introduce in a moment, uh, we have three of our book's contributors here with us today, Ambassador Tom Shannon, uh, Kevin Casasamora himself, and Professor Jane Jaquette. Mariana Bertucci, who is now a visiting fellow at the Inter-American Policy Center at Tulane, has a recent PhD from the University of Southern California, where we work together. He helped organize this volume, helped uh, and the original conference, helped commission and edit many of the chapters, contributed a chapter of his own, and collaborated closely with me on the final chapter in the book. So I want to take this opportunity and ask you to join in welcoming this rising star in the study of international and especially inter-American relations, Mariano Bertucci. Mariano and I are very grateful to Secretary General Insulza and Kevin Casasamoras for organizing and hosting this session and to Cynthia Arnson from the Woodrow Wilson Center's Latin American program for participating in the USC workshop uh, and now for co-sponsoring this launch. I now have the privilege of being a public policy scholar in the Latin American program at the Wilson Center. I must add that I have warm feelings of paternal pride both about the Latin American program at the Wilson Center and about the Inter-American Dialogue, thriving so many years after I left their direction, moving forward under vigorous and creative leadership in both cases. The book we are launching today addresses, as has been said, an important but too often neglected issue, how to enhance and improve the exchange between scholars and policymakers with the aims of improving policies as well as strengthening social science research and teaching. It draws upon contributions by outstanding social scientists who are keenly interested in helping to make public and international policies more effective, and by senior policymakers who want to be able to draw on academic research for the same purposes. Our contributors have diverse national and disciplinary backgrounds and rich experience with policy issues in the Americas, Europe, and Asia. The general literature on scholar-practitioner interaction in the field of international relations discusses a gap, even what some call a chasm, between those who study and those who act. Many policymakers, let's be frank, Think of scholars as absorbed in abstract and self-referential debates, as primarily uh, interested in crafting theories and impressing other scholars, rather than in illuminating, much less recommending solutions to, the pressing issues that policymakers have to address. Many scholars, again, let's be frank, in turn disdain what they see as simplifications and lack of analytic rigor, they often attribute to policymakers whom they typically perceive as interested in processes and outcomes, but not in understanding causality. Both analysts and practitioners have commented that this gap has been widening as scholars become more devoted to formal modeling and quantitative techniques while policymakers have ever less time to make their decisions with limited information in a rapidly changing world and so little time. The contributors to this symposium volume do not deny that there are serious obstacles to fruitful interaction between scholars and policymakers. 
Many of the chapters knowledgeably and in detail discuss these obstacles. But all of us engaged in the volume believe that mutually beneficial exchange, mindful of the differences, is a worthwhile goal that sometimes has been achieved. Many of the authors report in this book on their own personal experience in doing so. We have worked together to become more self-conscious and explicit about what works in practice and what does not, why and how. The volume discusses cases of fruitful scholar policymaker interaction on such issues as alleviating poverty, targeting financial sanctions, promoting democratic governance, improving gender equity, and managing the US-Mexico border. It also examines cases such as counter-narcotics policy and citizen security, where academic analysis has thus far mostly failed to affect policy and it analyzes why this has been the case. We explore how scholars can contribute more effectively to the articulation, development, implementation, evaluation, and course correction of international policies. The book also considers whether and how scholarship and teaching can be enhanced by more systematic exposure by faculty and students to the policy-making sphere. The volume derives in part from my own professional experience as a political scientist committed to trying to help understand and improve policy, the career to which Kevin made reference. Throughout that career, I have framed research projects with policy choices firmly in mind. My work has focused on such questions as these. How do multiple US government agencies and interest groups interact to produce policy outcomes on different kinds of issues? And how could these processes be reformed to achieve more coherent and effective policies? What are the internal fault lines within authoritarian regimes? What points of leverage exist to expand those? And how can improved understanding of those processes be employed to facilitate transitions toward democratic governance. Think of the O'Donnell Schmitter Whitehead project at the Wilson Center. Under what conditions, if any, can the US government and other external governmental and non-governmental actors foster and reinforce democratic governance abroad? How can Californians identify and promote their international interests in the era of globalization within the constraints of a federal system that reserves foreign policy to the central government? And the project that I've also just finished, which will be published this May, uh, a project I've done jointly in very close collaboration with Sergio Bitar from Chile, whom many of you may know, in which we interviewed former presidents and prime ministers from nine different countries in Asia, Africa, Europe, and Latin America who led transitions from authoritarian rule toward democratic governance, trying to learn from their experience lessons that might be relevant uh, in our period. Much of the work I have done has concentrated on identifying prevailing assumptions underlying policy and suggestion, suggesting how reframing issues might produce better analysis and better policy results. And much of my writing has uh, aimed to go beyond academic specialists to the policy community and the broader public. My interest in drawing upon research and analysis to improve the quality of policymaking has also shaped my approach to the institution building assignments that Kevin referred to. In each such effort, I worked with others to frame pol core policy relevant questions and to promote exchanges of ideas of these, around these, among thought and action leaders from different national and different political perspectives. We sought to improve communication and mutual comprehension between scholars and practitioners, between opinion shapers and decision makers and between North Americans, Latin Americans, and others. 
And we built bridges, we tried to, among the academic, business, non-governmental, and governmental sectors to connect scholars with policy interests, business executives with civic concerns, people from non-governmental organizations with conceptual and institution-building qualities, and public officials open to ideas and to working with business, academic, and NGO leaders. Given all these experiences, I have often been approached by students and junior colleagues who ask my advice on whether and how it is possible to help shape foreign policy and international affairs from an academic position. These people are usually of strong academic bent and vocation. They want to work and to be recognized as qualified social scientists. But they also are motivated to affect the world beyond the classroom and the learned journals. They sense that this is increasingly difficult in an academic career, where the incentives are ever more to emphasize rigorous methodology, quantitative analysis, and the somewhat narrow interests of a particular discipline. Our book is aimed in part to encourage young scholars with policy interests to pursue these and to persuade university administrators, department chairs, and other discipline gatekeepers, government agencies and international organizations, non-governmental organizations, funding sources, foreign policy journals, to develop new techniques that could help strengthen academic connections to policy issues and help make those connections more fruitful and effective. Time obviously doesn't permit me to share what all the chapters in this volume say. And besides, we want you to read, maybe even to buy the book. Let me just mention, therefore, the contributors in their chapters in the order in which they appear. In the first section of the book, Chap Lawson of MIT draws on his experience in the National Security Council and the Office of Customs and Border Protection, as well as his participation in the Joint Task Force of the Pacific Council and COMEXI in Mexico City to discuss what scholars bring to the government and take back again based on his own experiences. The late Bob Pastor, known to many of you, to whom with three other dear colleagues we dedicate the book, provides fascinating reflections on academia and politics, drawing from his experience at the Linowitz Commission on U.S.-Latin American Relations, the NSC, and the Carter Center. Jane Jaquette of Occidental College discusses the roles of scholars in setting agendas and framing issues, focusing on the case of the Women in Development Office in the U.S. Agency for International Development. Peter Andreas of Brown University discusses why scholars have been notoriously unable to affect policy on international narcotics trade, but he suggests a number of practical steps that might make them more effective. Blanca Heredia, Nora Lustig, and Kevin Casasamora draw upon their high-level experiences in academia, national governments, international organizations, and prominent think tanks to illustrate that social scientists can strongly influence public policy, for example, on the conditional cash transfer question that Secretary General Insulza mentioned, but why this is sometimes very difficult. And they each propose concrete steps to help overcome the gaps between academic research and public policy in different issue areas. Tom Bierstecker of the International Institute in Geneva shows how Brown's Watson Institute, which he directed for some years, developed means of analyzing, shaping, promoting, implementing, and evaluating measures to target financial sanctions as an international instrument uh, to affect the behavior of states who violate international norms. He highlights the importance of specialized transnational policy networks who become the go-to people on these international issues. 
Mitchell Seligson of Vanderbilt University, a principal invest investigator in a major AID project for the last several years on democratic governance, discusses how and why links between scholars and policymakers on this issue and in this project have been so dynamic and productive. Mariano Bertucci chronicles the important role of scholars, both outside and inside government, in helping Argentina in the 1990s dramatically reorient its foreign policy. In the penultimate section of the book, Ambassador Shannon and Rafael Fernandez de Castro, the chief foreign policy advisor to President Felipe Calderón of Mexico, insightfully discuss from the perspective of policy making, how scholars are helpful but could be much more so. And in the book's concluding section, Paul Evans, a leading Canadian authority on Asia, Lawrence Whitehead, a broad gauged authority on comparative politics, put the issues of this volume into comparative context and specify different ways in which scholars can relate to the policy world and discuss frankly, not only their, the advantages of doing so, but also the risks and how they can be protected against or mitigated. I can't resist sharing with you the opening uh, quotation of Whitehead's lucid essay. I should confess here with a number of friends in the room, I've developed a formula over the years for these many projects I've done I won't share all the components of the formula, but one component is add Lawrence Whitehead and stir. Uh, and if you go back and look at my uh, obra, you will find that I've taken that uh, recipe seriously. Uh, in opening his chapter, uh, Whitehead attributes to Yogi Berra, the famous American baseball player and sage, the following supposed observation. In theory, there is no difference between theory and practice. In practice, there is. <laughs> and then he goes on to discuss that uh, and to discuss very deftly and acutely uh, the situations in which uh, narrowing the gap between scholars and policymakers is to be advised and the situations in which protecting the difference between scholarship and the policy process is important. Finally, in the last chapter, Mariano and I do our best to suggest how to increase the likelihood that scholars wishing to engage policy issues will have more opportunities to do so, and how also to increase the likelihood that their scholarship will not only be enriched, but also better recognized within academic ranks. That's a challenge given the culture of the academic world, but we think maybe there's beginning to be a counter trend and that we can help move it along. We think of this book not as the last word on a tired subject, but hopefully as a means of opening up some more positive and constructive exploration of how academic research could contribute to improve policy making. The panel discussion we're about to hear is exactly an example of the kind of exploration we hope our book may stimulate. In today's world, we badly need the benefit of disciplined, rigorous, well-informed, comparative and historical exploration of the drivers of international problems and opportunities. There are a number of people in this room who are dedicated to that proposition. We need to work together to expand our ranks. Thank you very much for coming and for listening to my remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Abe. Let us go ahead with the discussion, which will be moderated by Dr. Cynthia Arnson. She's the director of the Latin American program at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. Her most recent work has focused on democratic governance, conflict resolution, citizen security, and organized crime, international relations, and U.S. policy in the Western Hemisphere. She is a member of the Editorial Advisory Board of Foreign Affairs Latino America, 
the Spanish language edition of the Distinguished Journal of Foreign Affairs. She's also a member of the advisory boards of Human Rights Watch for the Americas and the Social Science Research Council's Conflict Prevention and Peace Forum. Dr. Aronson served as Associate Director of the Americas Division uh, from 1990 to 1994, covering Central America and Colombia. She graduated magna cum laude from Wesleyan University and has an MA and PhD in International Relations from the Johns Hopkins University School of Advanced International Studies. Cindy will be joined by Ambassador Thomas Shannon, Counselor of the U.S. Department of State, and Dr. Fred Bernstein, Senior Fellow and Director Emeritus of the Peterson Institution from inter for International Economics, who will discuss how scholars can contribute more effectively to policymaking. Cindy. Great. Thank you. Wonderful. Kevin, thank you very much for that warm introduction. Thanks for joining with us. Thank you to Secretary General Insulza for, um, for this opportunity. Um, Abe will appreciate um, the reference to the Talmud, which says that those who dare to speak in front of their teachers should be put to death. So I would ask for a little bit of, of sympathy and leniency and mercy. Um, I think actually not only Abe, but also Fred and, and Tom, perhaps unbeknownst to them, have been great teachers and examples of, of leadership, um, of diplomacy, and, and real class. So um, I would like to uh, ask all of them for their indulgence in making some brief opening remarks. Um, Abe, I do have to thank you for founding the Latin American program. I am humbled and honored uh, to occupy the position that you once had and very much hope that we are accurately and um, responsibly fulfilling the mission of the program, which is precisely to link the worlds of scholarship and that of public policy. And we know many of you in the room, we've interacted, you've been on panels, you're on our board. Um, I'm here with Paulo Sotero, the director of the Brazil Institute, with Veronica Colon of the Latin American Program, and I welcome your, all of your input as to how to fulfill that mission um, in, a, in a better and, uh, and richer and more meaningful way. Um, I'd like to ask um, our panels, just drawing on the opening uh, statements of Kevin and, and of Abe, to have in the back of their mind um, several of the points that I think come through and several things that probably characterize the current state of affairs between scholars and policymakers. The first is that for most people in Washington, the term academic is a pejorative term. It's seen as someone removed, as someone almost in an ivory tower, as Abe pointed out, more interested in theory and models than in applying those kinds of concepts to real world problems. Um, for policymakers, um, there is in this hypercharged world of rapid communications, email, um, overwhelming amounts of information, there is truly almost an inability to sit down and read um, a book, let alone a journal article. Uh, people want things um, not necessarily in tweets, but in a paragraph or two or in, in talking points. So given those constraints of the un unbelievable demands on people's time, the number of things that they have to um, address, how is it that scholars and people who care about the policy process can most meaningfully um, shape it and, and uh, participate? And a third comment is that um, the State Department, the OAS, many institutions in this city actively seek out the leaders of think tanks. I received an invitation this morning to a... To a, a confab with, uh, with the Secretary General. Um, this is done regularly. I think Tom was a pioneer when he was Assistant Secretary of State for Latin America in, a, in reaching out to the various heads of think tanks um, to ask for their input and ideas. There are special briefings once uh, an important trip has taken place to bring people in, perhaps to co-opt them, but at least to have that kind of exchange with the people who are seen as leaders um, uh, and opinion shapers um, in this world. So, but that is not the same thing as engaging scholars. Think tanks 
sometimes have scholars in them and sometimes they don't, but beyond the, the handful of universities that are based in Washington, there is really very little regular interaction between scholars. I've attended Latin American Studies conferences for decades, and I would say that the participation of policymakers in those kinds um, of conferences and, and gatherings is at, at an all-time low. Um, so what does that reflect about what scholars and academics are doing or not doing. So with those brief questions, I will invite um, the remarks first of Ambassador Shannon, then of, of uh, Dr. Bergsten. They've been invited. There are copies of the bios um, that are available. So I will just briefly say that uh, Fred, Dr. Fred Bergsten is a model of of how you combine scholarship and policymaking. He's had any number of positions starting at the ripe age of 27 when he was an advisor to, sec to um, National Security Advisor Henry Kissinger. He's had positions um, in, um, in Treasury in the Export-Import Bank, um, continues as an advisor to President Obama on economic matters. He also is the founder of the Peterson Institute on International Economics, which is the, the leading voice in this city and I think around the country for, um, for the uh, policy-relevant understanding of economic, international economic issues. Um, Tom, again, I'll depart from the bio. He is one of the handful of people that has occupied um, the position of counselor of the State Department. He is only one in how many? In 30, he's the first one in 32 years. I think it's a... Um, um, a sign of recognition for the stature that he brings for the wealth of experience, not only as an assistant secretary for the Western Hemisphere, also as U.S. ambassador to Brazil, and as a person who has had many diplomatic postings throughout the hemisphere and has really dedicated his professional life um, to understanding and improving the relationship between the United States and the countries of Latin America. So with that introduction, I'll ask Tom to either um, sit in his chair or come to the microphone, uh, whatever, whatever suits you. Okay. Thank, you. No, thank you very much, uh, Cynthia, and I'm going to sit. And uh, I'll keep my remarks short uh, because I think it's important to get a dialogue uh, going here uh, because this is a big issue and an important issue. And uh, I want to thank the Secretary General and the Assistant Secretary General uh, for, for hosting this and uh, uh, opening this, this beautiful hall for this, this event. Uh, but I especially want to thank uh, Abe Lowenthal and Mariano Batucci, Batucci for the tremendous work that they did in putting the conference, the original conference together, and then putting together this book, uh, which uh, I, I have been reading and rereading and, and learning uh, from uh, each time. And I also want to recognize the presence of Luigi Anaudi here, um, who is the embodiment of the scholar practitioner. So Luigi, thank you for, for being here today. Um, from my point of view, this is a, a hugely important theme, uh, how you link uh, scholars and, and practitioners uh, for both scholarly reasons and practice reasons, uh, not only in terms of understanding, but also in terms of, of action. Uh, and as I think back on the conference that was held at the University of Southern California back in 2011 and uh, think of the, the intellectual dynamism that was present as people grappled with this problem of, of how you, you link uh, scholars and practitioners and how you get from that linkage uh, not only a better, uh, a better scholarship but also a, a better diplomacy and a better engagement and, and policy making uh, in the world. What, uh, what struck me towards the end uh, was that there was a certain kind of uh, what the Brazilians would call saudade uh, for the public intellectual. Saudade is kind of a, a bittersweet, almost an aching nostalgia uh, for a period in time in which there was easy passage uh, between the ranks of academia and, uh, and government, uh, and in which there were figures who were clearly marked as public in, uh, intellectuals, uh, government officials who were of su sufficient intelligence and stature and uh, sufficiently articulate that they were respected in academia and scholars who moved easily into government and made very, very important contributions. And the concern that this had been declining over time um, for a variety of reasons, and, and I don't know if that was an accurate perception or not, but I think the worry uh, kind of coursing through the, the conference uh, was, as Abe noted, uh, an increasing specialization in academia, an increasing focus on, on uh, niche studies that was limiting the ability of scholars to project a, a larger understanding. Uh, and on the part of practitioners, just being overwhelmed by events uh, and simply not having 
the time and in some instances the inclination to, to focus beyond the immediacy or the urgency of, of a problem uh, because the political consequences of, of not getting that problem right uh, were just too big. Uh, but as we, as we worked through the, the conference, it became apparent to me that, that it was terribly important to, to try to reconnect uh, academia and government. Uh, but not just to do it in a, in a single linkage, but to recognize that in the very dynamic, we, dynamic world that we live in, in a world in which political, economic, and social change is, is, uh, has velocity to it, uh, and its speed is actually increasing uh, over time, uh, that we needed, first of all, to, to start building new places where scholars and, and government can meet. Uh, and many of them already exist in terms of think tanks and a variety of institutions, whether it be our war colleges, uh, our U.S. Institute of Peace, uh, or other, other institutions that typically try to bring together uh, scholars and practitioners, uh, whether it be in existing programs like um, uh, diplomats in residence programs or actually put uh, policymakers and, and diplomats into universities or programs we have at the State Department and elsewhere in the U.S. government where we bring uh, scholars into government to give them some access and understanding of what's happening uh, in government, uh, but per perhaps more importantly, allow them to bring their expertise in very specific areas, you know, from climate change to cybersecurity to the internet and beyond, to, to understanding how, um, uh, how, how the world works and, and explain to, to policymakers uh, some of the, the more intricate aspects of, of the problems that, that, that we're dealing with. Um, but I, I think that, that the, when I say that the linkage can't just be between scholars and practitioners, what I mean is that we live in an increasingly uh, democratic world. Even in authoritarian governments, the, the voices of, of the people and the population find ways to express themselves. And I believe that increasingly uh, scholars are going to need to find a way to communicate not just to government, but with publics. And, and I think that's where, in some ways, the, uh, the saudade, the nostalgia for prominent public intellectuals really came through uh, in, in this conference uh, because policymakers and diplomats uh, don't exist in an immaculate place. We exist in a really complicated and cramped place where we are buffeted by all kinds of political winds, whether it be from formal institutions like our Congress, whether it be from people along our border protesting uh, the uh, uh, migration issues or, or any number of of uh, events, uh, we find ourselves responding uh, to, to politics in a, a very real-time kind of way. And so to have uh, ac acad academicians and scholars who have a capability of projecting not just the minutia of a problem to us, but explaining broadly how to understand problems uh, to a larger public and helping to shape a debate that moves beyond partisanship and moves beyond uh, ideological moorings, but actually helps people expand their horizons and, and expand their understanding of big public events, it's actually a huge benefit uh, to, uh, to practitioners. Um, and we, uh, we live in a time that all of you know well, uh, connected through in informatics and uh, a revolution in our information technology, uh, and we really are at a moment in which we are only as dumb as we want to be, uh, because there is an access to information uh, and an ability to, to pull in analysis and, and uh, scholarly thought that, that hasn't existed before. And in fact, in, in my essay, if I remember right, I, I think I quoted uh, Dean Acheson looking back at, at what he and his colleagues had done during World War II, saying that uh, as, they, as they launched uh, uh, their efforts in World War II and then faced the, the Cold War, that they did so with, with uh, confidence, buoyant determination, and ignorance of what they were facing. Um, and maybe if they had known what they were facing, they wouldn't have been so buoyant. Uh, but the reality is, today, we, we cannot claim ignorance. Uh, we know what's happening out there. We just need to find the way to connect that knowledge in, in a meaningful fashion. Uh, and then, hopefully, that knowledge will supply the buoyant determination and the confidence that would allow us to, to address problems. But I, I think I'll stop there. Thank you. Fred? I'm going to speak from the perspective of a think tank rather than the academic world. Uh, Cynthia, you said some very nice things about me and my institute. Abe did so in the book. I thank you for that. Um, and I'd like to give you a real-time example from last night. Um, 
half a dozen of my colleagues from our institute and I spent two hours over dinner with the president's deputy for international economic policy, the senior official from the Treasury Department, and the top international governor of the Federal Reserve Board to talk about issues that are going to be front and center when the president goes to Asia for the next two weeks. He leaves Saturday night. He's going to three consecutive summits, APEC, which will include a meeting of the heads of state of the countries negotiating the Trans-Pacific Partnership, trying to move that close to conclusion. G20 summit in Australia will be the culmination of that trip. And so we had two hours to talk with three of the top U.S. officials on those topics. So I think the interesting question for today's discussion is, why did they want to spend two hours with us? Why did they want to listen to us? Why did they want us, totally from outside government, not in any way akin to them politically, to brainstorm the issues that they've got right on their plates when they've got a very busy agenda? And I think the answer comes from the things we try to do as a think tank to make research and intellectual work relevant in the real world. And those are maybe kind of the guidelines that we're looking for in this conference today. The first, of course, is to make sure you've got a very relevant agenda, that you try to anticipate the real world policy concerns so that you can develop in-depth research related to those issues, if you do it right, even before they hit the headlines so that you're ready with ideas, analysis, proposals uh, when the policymakers uh, are seized of the topic. Uh, secondly, you have to really link the best intellectual work, cutting edge academic intellectual thinking, to the real world. And that means you need researchers, whether in the academic world or in a think tank, who can do that. In our case, we've done it, and I've been both fortunate as well as skillful, in having as our senior fellows people who combined experience in the intellectual world, extensive research, publications, reputations in the intellectual world, with real world experience in policy as government officials, officials of international institutions, so that it's in their DNA to try to link the research and the intellectual endeavors with real world questions and be fusing those consistently and constantly in their own work. Thirdly, then, you've got to convey your results in an intelligible manner. You can't publish a bunch of equations and data sets. You've got to have those. They're in the appendices. They're in the backup technical articles. But you've got to present in a narrative that's at a minimum understandable, hopefully attractive, to your readers who care about the policy questions and the outcomes. Um, and fourth, you have to overpin or undergird all of that with absolute intellectual integrity. You have to develop and maintain a reputation for objectivity, balance, and integrity. If you're viewed as politically partisan, if you're viewed as ideologically extreme, if you're viewed as touting the causes of your funders, if you're doing any of those things, you're out. You're not going to have credibility. And so intellectual reputation is absolutely essential to make all of those other things work. Now, that's from the perspective of a think tank. It doesn't go directly to the question here of how to have better input from academics to the real world. So I guess my conclusion is join a think tank. Um, if you're an intellectual, a researcher, an academic who wants to have an impact in the real world, join a think tank. That's not as easy as it sounds because, as Abe said, uh, people coming out of economics PhD programs now at all the top universities are afraid to do it. They're afraid to devote their talents to policy questions, even when they're very interested in them, because it will deflect them from their tenure tracks of doing uh, methodological, data-heavy, uh, refereed articles in professional journals. And even their mentors, even when those mentors are themselves involved in policy, tell them to spend the next 20 years 
doing articles in the American Economic Review and don't risk your life by working on policy. That, of course, is crazy in terms of the national or the social interest in attracting and applying talent to real world questions. Um, it also wastes a lot of time if those people really want to work on real world questions in their life. So I say, not with facetiousness, join a think tank. Do join one that meets those criteria that I mentioned because then you maximize your chance for impact. Um, my good friend Larry Summers has put it nicely. Uh, when Kevin started out, he, he quoted Keynes uh, with the famous uh, statement uh, that the, uh, the results coming out of any policymaker are the result of uh, uh, some obscure economist, Keynes said uh, back in uh, uh, some earlier period. Larry Summers has updated that. When he, when he came to speak at my institute when he was Secretary of Treasury in the late 90s, he said, you know, once you're in government, you have no chance to think. Uh, you spend all your time uh, fighting fires. So he says, the ideas that we in government utilize come from faxes from think tanks. This was in 1999. Then when he was in the White House, President Obama, the last couple of years, he came back to my institute. He said, well, I have to update that. They now come from a tweet from some prominent think tanks. But the same point that officialdom, and this was last night's dinner, officialdom does look to an important extent to think tanks as a bridge between the intellectual world and the policy world. I think Abe or somebody in the new book makes that point, like, conceives of think tanks as kind of a, a, a bridge between the two worlds. And I think that is, uh, in fact, the case. Um, officials in this country, maybe to a lesser extent elsewhere, but certainly in this country do look to that channel to enable them to have access to the best thinking, and many policymakers do want that. Uh, they look to think tank as a way to achieve that. It's then, of course, up to the think tanks to meet that demand in an effective way. I suggest several uh, criteria for trying to do so. Uh, I'll leave it at that for the moment, and uh, we can go further if you want. Thank you all for the uh, Thank you both for those presentations. Um, I, I do want to open it up really quickly, but Abe, if you have a tweet length or a uh, bullet point um, set of responses to what you've just heard or uh, whether these comments have been reflected in the chapters of the book or something that, that responds to, to the, the comments just made, you don't have to. If you would prefer not to, we'll just move to the audience. Well, I've had a chance to, to, you know, take quite a bit of time to share uh, about the book, so I don't want to take much time now. I'd rather hear what's on people's mind. I guess the only thing I would add is we try in the book to go from the observations about the cultures and the uh, habits and the pressures uh, and the incentives uh, to try and suggest specific ways that those can be addressed. Uh, for example, on incentives. What Fred said about academic economists coming out not really being ready even to join the, you know, the best think tank on international economics because it's a risk uh, to get involved in in, in the policy uh, world. Um, that's undoubtedly true and undoubtedly a significant part of the problem and not just in economics. Um, could you do anything about that? Well, one of the observations I have is that in the disciplines and in the university departments, all the incentives are stacked against the person who wants to do policy relevant work. Right. But at higher levels of the university, the president, the provost, even uh, major deans, uh, they see the world somewhat differently. And they know that the university's viability uh, as a social institution, its capacity to generate resources to support its mission, depend in part on the community understanding that something 
socially useful is coming out of these institutions. And that uh, telling them that, well, there's really marvelous equations uh, and they're understandable to a priestly tribe, but no one else is paying any attention to them, that doesn't cut much weight when you're looking for uh, a way of showing your, your, your relevance. Um, so my experience and that of a number of us who are in this project is that at top levels of universities, our work is greatly valued uh, because it's, it seems relevant uh, to the community. So there are things that university administrators could do. They could let the departments know that if they have people in their department who have policy interests, they should tell them, you know, if you want to go spend a year or two years working in Fred in, in the uh, Peterson Institute or working in policy planning in, in the State Department or somewhere else, uh, with the International Affairs Fellowships of the Council on Foreign Relations, which have existed for a long time. I was one of the first fellowship holders in that program. Uh, but it's been increasingly difficult to find academics who will take the year uh, to do that. Why is that? It's because the, the young scholar perceives that the year spent or the two years spent in one of those activities will not be valued in the tenure and promotion process. But university administrators could s signal, could tell departments, look, Somebody who wants to do one of these things, which might turn out to be socially useful, uh, don't count that time against the tenure clock. Uh, just tell them, if you want to go do that, fine. How valuable it is, we'll see. But at least you, we will relieve the pressure on you to have accomplished something by such and such a date, because you have a different approach. Just that simple change would probably have an effect. So we tried to think of a number of such things, and there are people in this room and among other future readers of this book who will have more and better ideas about concrete things that can be done that might incrementally make a difference. So I invite people to think about and suggest those. I think I'd be very remiss in my uh, duties as moderator if I didn't indicate that there are books for sale outside the tour. So you should all snap them up um, immediately upon exiting at a discount, even better. OK, um, we have some time for questions and, and interchange with um, those of you who have uh, gathered today. So please identify yourself. Uh, wait for a microphone. They'll be wandering around with a um, wireless mic. Floor is open. My gosh. Right here. Um, thank you so much for your presentations. Um, so my starting point is, uh, you say that there is a gap between, uh, sorry, I have to say where, yeah. My name is Karen Vosikovic, sorry. I'm from the Secretary, Secretary for Political Affairs. And um, my question will start from uh, your affirmation that there is a gap between scholars and practitioners. And I'm wondering whether this is a um, cross-cutting issue within the region or whether we have nuances in the different countries. I hear that Bartucci's chapter, he talks about Argent Argentina and how scholars were able to impact on the foreign policy. So I'm wondering whether we see nuances in the countries regarding this gap. Also, um, I want to know whether you have a baseline, wh whether you have um, uh, wh whether you depart your uh, investigation uh, starting from a baseline, understanding what the current situation is, um, and also whether there is any possibility to measure any advances in uh, bridging the gap between scholars and practitioners. And also, I think it's very important um, when a couple of you mentioned the fact that there seems to be a clash of interest or a clash of um, incentives between the, the the world of scholars and the world of practitioners. And um, if we just think of the world of the scholars, uh, we see that universities, um, by the fact that you need to get um, a tenure track, for example, uh, that might be a disincentive for um, scholars to go into the policy uh, world. So I'm wondering whether we are seeing any changes regarding uh, study programs at the PhD level to incent to to create incentives for these scholars to go into the policy areas or not. That's it. 
Sure, do we have another question? I'm, I'm just gonna simply indicate that there are a number of people in this room who have had direct experience. Um, ambassador Maisto, former uh, U.S. Ambassador to the OAS, Alec Watson, former Assistant Secretary of State for Latin America, Bill Leo Grand, Dean of School of Public Affairs at AU, who worked on the Hill, Vic Johnson, who was the Staff Director of the Western Hemisphere Subcommittee during a very raucous time um, in the debates over Central America. So I would really urge you to um, speak up and, and offer your reflections and thoughts from your own experience. Um, Secretary General, por favor, uh, microphone. Um, right, no, excuse me. Um, uh, we need a microphone for uh, Secretary General Insulza. Um, you want to use mine? Here it comes, here it comes, here it comes. I think there are two matters that, uh, I, don't, I don't know what the answer is, I must admit that. Eh? I mean, one is what uh, the, the, the title of, of Tom's uh, piece, uh, is, I think is a very provocative one the long diplomacy. And I think that he, he said also that uh, uh, in, at this, in these times, no, 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 not probably not 50 years ago, but now in several areas, I'm not really sure about foreign policy, but in other areas, you know exactly, I mean, a scientist can tell you exactly what's going to happen. I remember reading a book about, uh, about, about uh, some years ago, I had to write something about uh, the, megal the megalopolis crisis in Latin America, and uh, there was an excellent book published by a very interesting group that said 30 years ago exactly what's going to happen to Latin American cities. But uh, it, ha it happened anyway, because policymakers have different timing. I mean, uh, uh, scholars have a, a life achievement the main achievement is several politicians is getting elected next time, and they, they have a much shorter span to carry out. So how do you con how do you reconcile that? And the other one is that, Fred, you said that um, you met a lot of very interesting people last night, but they all had been they they all had uh, probably more or less the same background, which you and several on the, on the other side of the table had. Uh, most uh, people who are really in practical politics. And have never been, or we don't attempt to be scholars. So there's like a difference in this. There's the people who run the government. The people who run the government, in, in Latin America at least, are much more, uh, much more, have a, lot, a lot more schooling than the ones who ran it before. When I arrived in Mexico, for example, I remember that the, case, the cash phrase was always, look, the doctors to the cubicles. This is the world of the licenciados, they said. Well, actually, most of the recent presidents of Mexico have been doctors, have, been, have had PhDs. They continue to be calling, called licenciados, but they, they studied in very good, 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 uh, good universities. They have PhDs in several universities. And most of the people working basically in economic affairs, also in other areas, have also very similar backgrounds. So the dialogue with those, with that sector of society, with that sector of the scholars, it's much easier than, oh, excuse me, that sector of the practitioners, it's much, much easier in a common language than the one with the, with the people who are elected, who usually don't, I mean, don't deal, I'm not saying that they are much more or less than, 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 than any of the others, but they have different points of views and different life experiences that make it very difficult to go into a, 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 a long-term vision of what has to be done. So how do you go about with those problems? I think that's, that's part of life. I mean, we have, we are not going to, we're not really going to change it that, uh, that soon. I mean, I think that some, some things have been proposed here, but I think that the, the problem exists, the long term and the short term and the completely different experiences, experiences of, uh, of uh, scholars and practitioners. Practitioner. Mm -hmm. One of the risks of identifying people by name in the audience is you always miss people, so I apologize in advance to those that I have neglected to recognize, but I certainly do want to recognize Kevin Casasamorta and Assistant Secretary General, former Assistant Secretary General Luigi Ainaudi as people who have also occupied and straddled these worlds. So who would like to uh, go, uh, let's take one more comment from Bill Leo Grand, and then we'll go back to the, uh, ah, and uh, there were actually two, we'll have another round, so hold it, let's take Bill, and then we'll go back to the panel. Is there a microphone over this way? Thanks. 
Thank you. Um, uh, so being from American University, which is here in Washington, D.C., I think our university has always been more open to and more willing to accept faculty members who are interested in combining both scholarly research and, and policy relevance. And yet, having been dean of the School of Public Affairs for a number of years, I can tell you that no one gets tenure um, by focusing on policy relevant research if it isn't also uh, publishable in scholarly journals and respected in the scholarly community. So I think for junior faculty members in particular, it's a very, very uh, difficult challenge for them. They have to be able to do both the academic research that's publishable in academic journals with all the formalism and theory that that implies, um, and at the same time be capable of publishing or popularizing, rather, that research in a way that's accessible to policymakers if, if they want to be successful. Um, one of the problems is that not only is the incentive structure uh, disincentivizing for junior faculty to do this. They're also, in most universities, and I include our own, although we're, we're trying to deal with this issue now, there isn't a support structure, even for senior faculty members, to make it easier for them to do this. Uh, faculty members going to graduate school don't get trained in how to be uh, effective in policy advocacy. Uh, they don't get trained in how to write an op-ed piece or, or even how to write for uh, a journal like Foreign Affairs or Foreign Policy. Um, so until universities begin to create support systems to help faculty members know how to do this, I think it's going to be hard for even for senior faculty members uh, to become better at it. And, and I think Fred Burston is right in, in, in a certain sense. I would recommend junior, uh, junior or senior faculty members to, if not leave their academic positions, at least attach themselves in some way to uh, a think tank, because think tanks are very good at providing that kind of support structure for people to show them how to be involved in the policy process, something universities still need to come to. Great. Okay, Tom and Fred, comments, responses? Yeah, I'm happy to start. Uh, and actually, the, the question about you know, how this differs from country to country in the region is a really good one. And it would take a, a while to, to work through them all. But I think you're right. It does differ, uh, depending on the size of the country, depending on its, uh, its own uh, political and diplomatic history, and the extent to which um, technocrats played a, have played an important role in, in how different aspects of the government have run. Um, but it's, it's certainly a, a question worth exploring uh, further, uh, because we, I think we can learn a lot about how different countries have, have managed this. I, I would argue, uh, probably, that in those countries which have been gone through kind of a, a democratic effervescence uh, and have uh, kind of moved away from uh, kind of elite management of, of government and have become more populist in their approach, uh, that in that sense there has been a break uh, between academia and. Uh, and, and governments, because um, the, the elite presence in the government is, is much less than it was. And so that has to be rebuilt in some fashion. Um, I, I think for the, the greater good of both the academia in those countries and, and also the elites. Uh, I would also argue that given the political history of universities, uh, there are still many universities that, uh, in the region that are quite adverse to uh, immersing themselves in politics um, because of what that meant at one point in their history and how the universities were islands of of, uh, of, um, uh, of intellectual sanity as something else was happening beyond uh, the, the boundaries of, of the university. Uh, but in that regard, when we think about how you link scholars and practitioners, I, re I talked earlier about the necessity of linking scholars in our larger society. I think in, in this hemisphere, at least, we also need to begin linking uh, academic communities across the hemisphere. And in many ways, academic communities are lagging way behind. Uh, the rest of our societies in terms of connectivity. Uh, and they're doing it because of the difficulty uh, in, in exchanging credits and certifications for students you know, who migrate through different university systems. Uh, but also we're seeing it in terms of, uh, of how credentialing of, of faculty is understood. And it's much harder for, for people to, to move across the hemisphere and work in, in different uh, universities and, and uh, intellectual structures. Uh, in many ways, universities are some of the last closed shops uh, in, in the Americas. And you really need your union card you know, to work in, in certain kinds of, of intellectual settings. And when I was in Brazil, 
both through the Science Without Borders program that the Brazilians were promoting and President Obama's uh, 100,000 strong in the Americas. We were looking for ways to, to break that down by exchanging students. Uh, but, but we were also looking uh, for ways to build better relationships between institutions and look for ways to harmonize some of our understandings of credits and credentialing uh, so that we could move not just students but faculty easily, more, more easily and that this would, like, would, would leaven the intellectual debate in, in the region and actually open a space uh, for the kinds of public intellectuals uh, that we're looking for, uh, but also uh, affect have scholars affect students, because by affecting students, you're affecting practitioners, because so many of your students end up becoming practitioners. Uh, the Secretary General raised a very subtle and very profound question, which relates to the homogeneity or lack thereof between the supply and demand size of the equation. Um, you're absolutely right. The people that I and my colleagues were talking to last night come from the same basic mindset and intellectual foundation. We speak the same language. At the same time, we can have very strong disagreements. It certainly expedites the conversation, makes it much more efficient when we're talking with people like that, but it does not by any means reduce the, uh, uh, the importance of having the discussions, opening them up to broader points of view, and from their standpoint, checking out their assumptions and their approaches uh, with knowledgeable people outside their own uh, government. So uh, you're absolutely right in the sense of the uh, homogeneity, the similarity of backgrounds and uh, intellectual frameworks, but I, I, this was not necessarily your implication, but I don't think that to any extent reduces the importance of having the kind of interchange I'm talking about. However, then there's another audience that we have which is very different, and I'll just simplify a little bit by calling it the Congress, where the Congress, certainly the members, and even a lot of the staff, uh, by nature of their responsibilities and backgrounds, do not have the same homogeneity of intellectual foundation, even vocabulary, that we would use with fellow experts in discussing issues. So we have to frame and uh, articulate the issues we're describing in very different ways. I mean, when I'm testifying to a Senate committee, I'm using very different language, very different logical constructs than when I'm talking with the White House and Treasury experts on the topic at a dinner like last night. So I think then it is very importantly a matter of presentation and trying to find ways, and this was the gentleman from American U just, just raised that point about uh, professors there, understanding how to present your message to the different audiences that are critically involved in the policy process. One size does not fit all. There are very different uh, uh, constituencies and participants in the policy process. One thing the United States has going for it relative to most countries is the degree of interchange between government and the intellectual world. Think tanks, but the academic world as well. Uh, maybe not as much as in the past, as was said earlier. Uh, but we do have a fair amount of mobility, uh, people from outside government moving into policy making positions and vice versa. Um, some of the countries in the hemisphere have it. We talked a little bit about Chile's experience where uh, a number of folks do move in and out of government. Um, but it's much less prevalent in other countries than in the United States, which gives the US an advantage in two senses. It means that people who have spent a lot of time trying to develop ideas and concepts uh, do often then get a shot at uh, implementing those in government itself. And it also means, as you suggested, that people in government are not only receptive to ideas from outside, but often seek those ideas because their own background has been, uh, has been rich with that. So it does depend a lot on the national environment, um, but 
your comment, that's why I say it's very subtle as well as profound, it also flags the need to be able to message your intellectual work in very different ways depending on your different audiences. Abe. Let me say a couple of things that follow from the first questioner or commentator uh, uh, said, asked whether we had done baseline studies uh, to sort of look at what the situation was at first and also what the differences were, whether there were nuanced differences between countries and so on and so forth. Well, we began with a literature review. Um, there's a lot of literature on the scholar practitioner relationship. Okay. Um, it, it varies as everything varies, but it is certainly a fair statement that the overwhelming conclusion of the existing literature is that there is a large gap uh, and that the gap is growing. So we didn't replicate uh, uh, research to establish that. It's pretty well established. Um, and we were involving in the project a number of people with firsthand experience at it. And there is ongoing research going on. There, there's a project which recently measured, it, it interviewed uh, by electronically uh, practitioners of American foreign policy in different government agencies and international organizations, and similarly academic specialists on international affairs to find out who they, whose work they valued. And there was very little correlation between what the academics think is valuable and what the the uh, practitioners think is valuable. One of the people who showed high on both lists, which is exceptional, is Joseph Nye. Um, Joe Nye has very warmly endorsed this book, and we uh, re refer to some of his work in the book. He's one of those, uh, which re relates to Bill Leograin's comment, he's one of those, he strongly believes in scholars trying to affect and improve policy. He's voted with his feet, he's done it brilliantly, and he's maintained his academic reputation with constant new thinking and writing. Um, but he recommends to graduate students who are interested in doing the same thing, don't do this until after you get tenure. Um, and we, with great respect for Joe Nye, we differ in our advice. Because we don't think it makes sense to take somebody who is highly motivated to work at the nexus between scholarship and public policy and tell that person, you just repress, suppress your real interest and play a game until you score in the game and then come back at some point to this or play a, have a double life in which you hide from your colleagues and, and uh, superiors in a department, what you're really interested in. We don't think that's the right way to motivate and to succeed. But on the other hand, we're aware of these disciplinary pressures. So the question comes for somebody in practical uh, terms, like Bill as a dean, um, what can you do? And we try to recommend specific uh, things. Um, uh, for example, I was in a the outside member of a PhD committee at USC in which a, a Brazilian student was doing a PhD in the field of economics and he was the, it was based on research in and about Brazil. So it occurred to them to invite me as an outside member of the committee. And you, you have to have, that's the academic tradition and mores, to have somebody outside the department uh, as part of the certification kosher process uh, for a new PhD. No, one does this. It's part of what one's duties are. Uh, I got the dissertation. I, I didn't look at it until the night before the uh, defense because, you know, one wants to have it fresh in mind. I looked at it, and it was all equations. It was utterly unintelligible to me. I mean, it could have been written in Chinese. It wouldn't have made a difference. Um, so I went to the, the thing the next day and I said, you know, I just read it last, I looked at it last night, I couldn't read it because I don't speak that language. Um, and uh, I, I feel in a way I shouldn't be on this committee, but it's too late to substitute, it's scheduled thing months in advance. Um, so I feel bad and I said to the department chair, uh, you know, I, I will ask some very general questions. 
but uh, it's really not based on having absorbed the dissertation. He said, well, you do your best. I mean, we do need you here. So when it came to my turn, drawing on some experience I had had in life, I asked the, the uh, candidate for the PhD, tell me, I can't read your dissertation because I don't speak that language. So tell me, basically, what's this all about? What does it add up to? And what difference does it make? The department chair stopped the proceedings at that moment and said, would you repeat that? I repeated it. He wrote it down. He said, from now on, I'm going to ask those questions in every PhD defense. Because we should be asking the candidate to explain what's this all about, what does it add up to, and what difference does it make? Those are the right questions. Well, we don't, as Bill said, we don't train our PhDs in many departments to address that question. Now, I happen to serve on the Alumni Council of the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences at Harvard. And at Harvard, they have been in the last three years investing in a special program, competitive in nature, in which I think 12 graduate students across the entire spectrum of graduate departments from you know, biology to political science to everything under the sun, uh, they compete for access to a special program that helps train them how to explain what they are doing to non-specialists. And they really work at this the same way they work at other things. And then they, they showcase them at the end of the year in, in the big lecture hall, Memorial Hall at, at, uh, at Harvard, and hundreds of people show up. These are the star graduate students. They do a brilliant job. And the, all the students feel they're getting a tremendous amount out of this program. And the development people who are very important at universities, you know, the people who go out and look for money, they say this is the best thing since sliced bread. To have graduate students who are doing cutting edge work on a variety of different fields, who are able to explain to people what they're doing and why it's important, what its implications are, it's revolutionary. That creates a direct path to support. So there are interests that could be mobilized. Uh, to just end, one of the points we make is, you know, there are a series of inherent tensions between rigor and relevance, uh, between uh, access and uh, autonomy. Uh, there are a series of tensions that need to be managed in this field. Learning how to manage those tensions, very difficult to teach a graduate course on that. Um, and you don't get it out of doing a research project. How do you get it? The best way to get it is through mentorship. How does mentorship occur? To many students, it is not obvious what seems obvious to me, which is mentorship occurs when somebody who wants and needs mentorship, looks for the right people to mentor her or him, and makes a persuasive case that it's worth your investing your time in mentoring me because this is the sort of thing I want to do and it's very much based on your experience and I want to learn from you. Mentors are not out there going around un underemployed looking for people to mentor. They're usually overemployed. But if you are looking for mentorship, you can find it. And that turns out to be extraordinarily important, as will be, I think, agreed to by virtually everyone who works at this nexus. Uh, so there are many things that could be done. And what we're trying to do is stimulate people not just to consider the ideas that we've put forward, but to think on the basis of your own experience. Jose Miguel is a, a perfect example of somebody who's had you know, tremendous experience politically uh, in his own country, in exile, in his own country, in international relations, uh, who has uh, many insights as to how to be effective. Uh, and who comes from an academic for formation. Finally, on this point about the nuanced differences and so on, 
Yes, Latin Amer there, I mean, one can quickly think of a number of Latin American social scientists, sociologists, political scientists, economics, who have risen to presidents of their countries. There aren't too many in the United States since Woodrow Wilson. Um, but one of the reasons we motivated some very outstanding Latin Americans to participate in this project is that the tendency in Latin America and elsewhere in the world is for the American university model and the American university discipline to be increasingly influential. So that at pieces, places like Universidad de los Andes or ITAM and uh, CIDE and, and other places in Mexico and others that one can mention, there is ever more a tendency toward valuing the peer edited uh, review article uh, as the only way to contribute, the only way to be evaluated. One should sort of push against that, and we're trying to, without minimizing in any way the importance of rigorous research, which Fred pointed Good. out was Good. essential. We are losing Fred Bergston. Thank you for joining us. I'll take two more questions, and then we're going to wrap up. Thank you, Fred. OK, sir, I'm going to. Take this gentleman here, and then John Mace, Ambassador Maisto had his hand up. So why don't we take both those questions, and we'll come back. Kevin, you have a final comment. Can't resist. Go ahead. OK. Uh, por favor. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, excuse me. Thanks, everyone. Um, my question is from the public's perspective. For policymakers and academics, this conversation has been completely self-referencing. And I'm just wondering, have both communities made an effort, a serious effort, to include the public, as these are democracies after all. Mm -hmm. And I really do believe, at least in the United States, that the anti-intellectualism is an expression of their offense at being disincluded in the conversation. So can, can we have an idea of whether or not there are active efforts by universities, policymakers, and nonpartisan think tanks to actively communicate with the public, especially a public that you know understands that Literacy is no longer recognizing characters on a page, but being able to distinguish perspectives. And you know, many times people cannot understand when intellectualism is masqueraded I'm, or you know, masqueraded as <laughs> politics. So that's my question. Can you tell us who you are? I'm sorry. Um, my name is Joyce Jones. Um, I am a public relations professional um, that has contracts sometimes at the World Bank. Good. Ambassador Maisto. Uh, thank you. First of all, great that this event is taking place. Congratulations. The OAS should do more of it, Kevin. Um, I do think that think tanks are bridges between the intellectual world and the policy world. I think that's very important because in addition to being the bridge, they provide space. And I think that goes to the comment uh, we just heard. They provide a space where people from the Congress, people from the media, and if you're on the Wilson Center address list, you can get invited to things and, with, and, and to other places. But uh, you've got to show some interest if you're a citizen out there. Um, Washington is the ideal place for this. While I was in government 35, 36 years, um, you know, uh, I used to say it's important to listen to the, academ to the academic types and to the think tank types. It really is important to listen when you're in government. Uh, with regard, I'm, I've been out of several years now, but it's important for academics and think, type, think tank types, um, how can I put this delicately, not to talk down to people in government. Because when I was in government, I got the impression from time to time that it was, what do you people know? This is particularly true in times of if you're in one administration or another and the academic community and the, and the think tank community is of one persuasion, they think, you don't know anything and we really know it. Careful with that sort of thing. So there has to be more uh, mutual respect. Um, and um, listening uh, in terms of uh, both directions. Um, uh, is it important? Absolutely it's important. Uh, and uh, everybody has to open up. Uh, and uh, finally, from the point of view of understanding the importance of international organizations which are not well understood, 
along with all the frustrations and the questions about the relevance, Mr. Secretary General and Mr. Political Director, events like this are important because, very frankly, there's not much understanding and there's pretty much a disdain for the relevance of international organization. And this is where the think tanks and the academics can really help those who are in government and those who are outside of government and pay some attention to the Alec Watsons of the world <laughs> and people like that who have a lot of experience and, uh, and, uh, and uh, you know, a bit of a track record who can say a few things. Finally, one other thing. Um, there are regional organizations in other parts of the country. They're on the Pacific Coast. Uh, I'm going in three weeks to a meeting of an organization called MALAS, the Middle American Association of Latin American Studies. And why am I going? Because they're just a fun group of people who want to have some type of contact. So we've got to spread our wings a little bit. Okay, F final uh, question or comment from Kevin, and then we'll go back to Tom, and we'll finish. Thank you very much. Um, sh surely the, uh, the public discussion arena is more complicated than just scholars and, and, and practitioners. There's journalists. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, what's the role of journalists in this story, mm -hmm. considering the fact that, among other things, journalists can also be a conduit to influence public opinion and therefore to put political pressure upon policymakers? So what's the role of journalists in this story? Right. Links directly back, I think, to the first question about communicating with the yeah. public. Tom. Mm -hmm. uh, well, first of all, the, the point raised about involving publics and, and having a larger conversation with publics is, is a good one. I, I don't think the conversation here has been self-referential, though. Uh, I mean, Abe uh, underscored the, the importance of, of universities having a public relevance, and especially state institutions uh, that respond to state legislatures. Uh, obviously have to show that what they're doing in terms of what they're teaching, what their research is, uh, has meaning uh, and, and can, can be reflected and, and defended uh, uh, to, a, to a broader society. Uh, and I also uh, underscored the point that, that the conversation can't just, between, can't just be between scholars and practitioners. It really has to un understand that, especially those of us living in democratic societies, but even increasingly those of us living in authoritarian societies, have to be able to project a, a broader understanding uh, to the people uh, if we're going to uh, be able to affect policy in, in the long term and build consensus around, around policy and around uh, diplomacy. Uh, but, but the larger point is exactly on target. I mean, this is a conversation that has to be much bigger. Uh, and especially as we move into a world where uh, connectivity is really about societies and peoples and less about governments, in which governments are increasingly going to be uh, uh, connectors and facilitators of, of engagement between societies and peoples and much less determining how societies and, and peoples relate to each other. Uh, so in that sense, the extent to which uh, we in government and those in academia understand that we have a much larger audience than ourselves is going to be important. And that can be done in any number of ways. It can be done in a very old-fashioned public intellectual way where people are, are speaking to a larger community either through op-eds or through participating in, in radio talk shows or TV talk shows or going around uh, engaging with, with organizations uh, that represent um, a larger society. I also, however, think that it, it uh, requires much more intense engagement with our Congresses uh, because in our democratic societies, our Congresses really are representatives of the people. Uh, and and they, they do create a space where we can have a larger conversation with the public uh, through representatives. And I think that's true not just for the United States, it's true more broadly. So I, I would argue that not only do we as, as, as executive branch of government need to spend much more time focused on our, our Congress, but academia in the United States needs to spend much more time focused on, on our elected leaders and, and sharing with them their, their, their own insights. Well, if I could also address oh, I'm the sorry, question. Yeah, in, in terms of the journalism sure. part, journalism. That, that's yeah. a fascinating issue because journalism is changing in such a dramatic way. And in this town, journalists um, are um, walking and talking bulletin boards where they, there are points of communication for others. Uh, and I, I would argue that the, that the analytical work done in, in journalism now is quite poor. 
um, but the communication work is quite important. Uh, and kind of being able to link that in some fashion, being able to have journalists who are not just uh, helping one part of the government communicate with the other part of the government or having our Congress uh, communicate broadly with other parts of the government, but actually begin to, to uh, serve a, a larger uh, analytical purpose uh, is going to be very important. Think tanks act actively seek to be quoted in the media, and, and I know a number of institutions around town that actually count you know, the number of times that that happens, so it is a way of communicating directly. Abe, do you have a brief comment, and then I think we'll, uh, we'll wrap up. Sure, just because this important point about journalists was, was raised, I was lunching yesterday with Hector Chamis, and he told me he was discussing exactly this point with you. Um, it's an important point. Uh, uh, journalists, uh, uh, vary as, as academics and practitioners vary, but there are some, and some of the best, who are really good at burrowing in to find the relevant material that will in fact be relevant to broader audiences and being able to express that relevance and communicate it very, very well. Think of Michael Reed, for example, in terms of work on Latin America. When I'm asked by somebody from a who's not, not familiar with Latin America, I'm going on a trip to Latin America, what should I read? I always tell them read Michael Reed's book, uh, not something by any of the academic profession, but rather somebody with a very good training and a very good mind and, and way of thinking about things. Um, uh, we probably should pay more attention to the specific ways in which journalists could be uh, helpful in this. We do have some paragraphs devoted uh, to those journals, which are some, somewhere in an in-between space, like foreign affairs, foreign policy, and others, that help to communicate uh, learning and, and perspectives, some from the academic side, some from the practical side, some from the think tank side. And there are things that those journals could do that would make more effective use of academic expertise, and academics should pay more attention to how they can access and be helpful to those. So it's exactly one of those areas that uh, will be stimulated by uh, your comment and by discussions like this. Um, and where I think we're at the witching hour, so allow me to express personally on behalf of Mariano, our co-editor, all the other contributors in the volume, uh, our great appreciation to the Organization of American States, to the Woodrow Wilson Center, to the panelists uh, uh, who uh, are really the the, the best uh, examples of uh, what they brought uh, to this discussion, and to all of you for taking an interest in participating. Read the book. There you go. Hard to say anything greater than that. Thank you. Uh -huh. Thank you again to the Wilson Center for co-organizing this event with us. I want to thank uh, our very own colleagues from the uh, Secretariat of External Relations for helping us uh, put together this, this event. And uh, I want to thank my long-suffering colleagues, Marian Vidauri and Julia Malmo, for their hard work uh, in putting this event together. And I want to thank you all for making this roundtable a success. Thank you very much. <laughs>